picture in the New England Journal was this one. And it's an MRI. And what we can see here is there's a tumor, at least uh, in terms of a mass, uh, inside the eye itself, inside the vitreous humor, raging into the cavity. And it extends also outside the eye along the optic tract on the right side. I thought the history was confusing. The story is about a 59-year-old woman who has a four-day history of inflammation and pain in the right eye. Uh, that eye has been blind for several years, although the physicians didn't do an enucleation at that time, which they would have probably done uh, were this a malignant disease. But perhaps um, We'll just ignore that for a moment and just look at the picture and the differential diagnosis. Amaurosis fugax is fleeting blindness, where the people are blind in one eye, but it generally goes away in seconds, minutes to hours. It has a vascular cause associated with stroke, migraine headache, and uh, exactly how this works is not entirely clear. But since this woman has this large tumor in her right eye, this is not amaurosis fugax. A disseminated aspergillus. Um, fungal diseases of the orbit. Um, aspergillosis would uh, not uh, occur to me. There are other fungal diseases that might be considered, but aspergillosis is not one of them. A vitreous hemorrhage, that's conceivable in patients with diabetes, but this lesion extends outside of the eye itself. Uh, so we're left with uveal melanoma and T-cell lymphoma. And since the history also talks about lymphadenopathy and hepatic masses, et cetera, I guess both of these diseases are possible. Although T-cell lymphoma usually also involves the skin, there's a retrovirus that's associated with T-cell lymphoma. So we'll just have to pick one. And the answer is uh, uveal melanoma. Now I can't imagine that that was the diagnosis when the woman went blind several years ago or the eye would have been enucleated, but I guess next week we'll find out exactly what happened here. So this is, um, melanoma of the choroid uh, portion of the eye, uh, which is all of this material here. Uh, it, actually, it includes the iris, and these are, if they involve the iris, you can see them from the outside like this. Here's an example of a choroid melanoma that's uh, inside the, uh, the, uh, the choroid that you wouldn't see from the outside. Um, the choroid in German is called Adahaut, Adahaut, Melanoma. Uh, melanoma. Uh, this disease is um, uh, uh, very serious. Uh, since the eye isn't drained by lymphatic vessels, metastases have to be blood-borne, and that was apparently the diagnosis here. Amaurosis fugax. If the central artery of the retina is closed through spasm or thrombosis, then we would expect to see. Uh, the macula, which also has a blood supply from the back of the eye, as a red spot. But uh, this blindness was not fleeting and stayed that way. And the first topic at the, in the New England Journal concerns aortic valve replacement. And the first aortic valve was replaced in 1952 by Charles Hufnagel at Georgetown University. He put a valve-like contraption into the descending aorta. I don't think the patient was helped much. When I was a junior physician, the Star Edwards valve was available. You can imagine that uh, the blood to get around this poppet uh, ha encounters a considerable amount of resistance. And aortic valve replacement that we're going to discuss today can be done via a catheter. We see this um, wire framework here and very thin leaflets that very much resemble uh, the normal aortic valve uh, that we have. And this device can be set in place via a catheter. Uh, 
in such a fashion that the coronary ostea are maintained open. Now, this strategy has generally been applied to patients that are not candidates for an operative valve replacement because that procedure is so successful and has been performed for so many years that when this transcatheter valve replacement was introduced, it was um, utilized in patients that the surgeons didn't want to operate because the risk was too high. Now, the valve that we're talking about today, one of them is the Sapien 3 system. Uh, here we see a diseased aortic valve. Catheter is placed over uh, 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 the ostium into the left ventricle. Then this device is moved uh, over uh, um, a catheter and is then expanded via a balloon. And uh, in that way, the valve can be replaced. Now, in this first study, we're now looking at patients that would uh, be operated upon or subjected to this procedure. And up until now, uh, for patients that uh, are otherwise fit, uh, the operative replacement of the aortic valve has been favored. In this randomized controlled trial, uh, uh, Patients underwent, underwent transcatheter aortic valve replacement or were randomized to surgical aortic valve replacement treatment when either strategy uh, was reasonable. Uh, the ages of these patients is, or patients with aortic stenosis are generally older. Uh, most of these patients were uh, white males uh, U.S. studies, so body mass index is fairly generous. Uh, some had heart failure, some didn't, and th their various medical problems were distributed in both groups equally. Uh, the end point here was um, a composite of death, stroke, or rehospitalization at one year. So this is a composite endpoint, and the patients were randomized to treatment. And what we see here is that the composite endpoint was more common in the patients undergoing surgical valve replacement than it was in the patients undergoing a transcatheter valve replacement as shown here. And that difference was statistically significant and also clinically meaningful. Uh, stroke was actually less common in the patients undergoing the transcatheter valve replacement than in the operatively treated pa patients. Death from any cause, uh, the numbers are too small to have statistical significance, except for the combined endpoint, uh, but the difference here looks clinically meaningful, particularly also rehospitalization. And if we look at um, various subgroups of patients, the transcatheter valve replacement seemed to function better in all of these subgroups compared to the operative treatment. Uh, what's also important is that the new onset atrial fibrillation, which occurs commonly after valve replacement, was significantly reduced in the transcatheter treatment. And also, since the patients can go home in a few days and don't have a big sternotomy and wires and all of these awful things, we can imagine that their six-minute walk test was better, uh, at least up to a year. Uh, they were on their feet much more rapidly and their quality of life that was also measured was improved. So I think we have to conclude from this study that um, the transcatheter valve replacement seems to beat operative valve replacement irrespective of the condition of the patients uh, in terms of other medical problems. Uh, the second study is a similar study uh, also in comparing transcatheter aortic valve replacement to an operative intervention. Uh, the analysis here is uh, based on Bayesian methodology. Uh, the valve that was used here is a Medtronic valve, slightly different than the other one, but the principle is uh, precisely the same. Patients were also randomized to treatment and the primary endpoint was a composite of death or disabling stroke. And the hypothesis here is that the transcatheter valve replacement is no worse than operation. So this is a non-inferiority study. Uh, but again, it looks that uh, uh, the operatively uh, treated patients did worse than the catheter treated patients. At any rate, the catheter treatment was certainly not inferior to operative 
valve replacement according to this Bayesian analysis. And you can look at various details that are uh, shown here uh, that uh, seem to indicate that the transcatheter approach is certainly no worse than operative uh, approach, uh, looking at subgroups, qualities of life, uh, uh, presence of heart failure, and these various other things. So if we look at also the mechanics of this, if we look at the, the orifice area of the aortic valve after replacement, uh, if anything, it looks better with the transcatheter valve replacement than with the operative valve replacement, which means that the AV gradient after operation should be, uh, is actually less in the transcatheter treated group compared to the uh, operatively treated group. And this is what this valve looks like. So I think with these two studies, slightly different approaches, both indicating the transcatheter valve replacement uh, is certainly no worse and could be better than the operation uh, will certainly change the way that this disease is treated. Then there was a brief report, what do you do when the transcatheter valve replacement fails? And here's an example. This woman received such a valve 10 years ago because surgeons didn't want to operate on her because her aorta was diseased. And after 10 years, she was 68 when this was done. Now she's 78 and she's again got aortic stenosis in her transcatheter uh, prosthetic valve. So what was done here is uh, she got another transcatheter valve replacement that was merely placed inside the old valve, which was then pushed out of the way. And if we look at this, here it is. Uh, here we can even see the wire struts here in this uh, CT reconstruction here. Here's the aortic stenosis. Then we see the valve and uh, expand uh, valve expansion via the balloon and how this valve functions. And the new valve functioned at least as well as the old valve that she went home two days after the procedure instead of having to go to rehab and a bunch of other business. Next topic, those of you that are familiar with American football uh, can see that this is not a sport for pacifists and it's fairly violent and um, the people get it knocked around. I know they wear helmets and other protective gear, but the idea is to knock your opponent down if not silly. And this uh, sport has been associated with um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which has been known in boxers probably for thousands of years in Latin called dementia pugilistica. Now, when these people come to autopsy, uh, advanced chronic traumatic encephalopathy can look like this compared to a normal brain that looks like this. And we might imagine that this person can't count backwards serial sevens as well as this person. Now, if we compare that to Alzheimer's dementia, we can see uh, that the chronic traumatic encephalopathy is also seems to be associated with the deposit of uh, tau proteins and amyloid proteins that are similar to um, Alzheimer's disease. And indeed, the clinical presentation of these patients compared to Alzheimer's disease is not that different. Now, this issue is associated with American football, but can occur in a, all sorts of sports, has also a substantial medical legal implication. And the question is, uh, can we diagnose this condition uh, pre-mortem and people that are still alive. Uh, this is a descriptive study, and this is not a randomized trial, obviously. What was done here is um, 26 former American professional football players who complained of symptoms were subjected to imaging and com were compared to 31 control Americans that had not played football. Uh, the ages are not statistically different. Uh, racial distribution uh, may be different because uh, American football players, if they play uh, defensive positions, uh, are primarily African-Americans, but that's not necessarily so. 
uh, American football players generally go to college where they learn this sport, and they were actually more better educated than the controls. Now, many metals were done here, and the American football players with complaints had a mini mental score of 27 compared to the controls of 29. Now that's significantly different. In the mini mental score, 30 is a perfect score. And everyone that is listening to this program should surely get a 30 on their mini mentals. Um, now, uh, positive, uh, positive amyloid beta scans had been done on some subjects and uh, results are shown here. And then uh, uh, this um, florbetapir uh, is a radiopharmaceutical compound that contains the nuclide fluorine 18. Uh, and it was also used in this study that we're going to talk about. And another technique that was used here is SUVR. That's the ratio of radioactivity in a cerebral region compared to the cerebellum as a reference. Now the cerebellum shouldn't probably be affected by either Alzheimer's deposits or um, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy because it's sort of in the post, uh, posterior fossa and isn't subjected to so much trauma. So these 26 football players reported cognitive mood or behavioral discontrol sim symptoms and that's why they were enrolled in this study and compared to these controls. Now, to make a long story short, uh, the football players had more bilateral superior frontal lesions and particularly temporal lobe lesions compared to the controls. And uh, the left parietal, which was generally dominant in these patients, also seemed to be uh, more involved than the right parietal lesions. Now, these comparisons here are not affected compared to controls. It's more complicated, and I don't understand the math here at all. What I also don't understand is uh, uh, the right side is here, the left side is here. If this were a CT or a MRI, it would be the other way around. Uh, but what we here look at, what we're comparing here is um, uh, affected to controls, and what we see here is that uh, what lights up here is the frontal cortex and the temporal lobes as you can see here, particularly here, compared to the cerebellum that shouldn't light up hardly at all. And uh, when that is looked at in terms of three-dimensional stereotactic surface projection mapping, we also see temporal lobe involvement, uh, frontal lobe involvement, and the left parietal side is involved more than the right side. And that was all statistically analyzed comparing these two groups. And also, as we could imagine, the years of playing football are associated with more adverse SUVR values and indicating these correlations shown here. So in this descriptive study, uh, we can see evidence that football players, even when they're still alive, uh, can have clinical manifestations of uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and we can follow that with imaging. Now, the implications of these findings are complicated because what they mean in any individ given individual is different than what they, uh, uh, what's shown here in this analysis. And I suppose uh, the attorneys will have a field day with that. The next topic at the, in the New England Journal is chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy. Now you'll recall that we have T cells uh, that are supposed to attack cancer cells in case we get one. And one of the problems seems to be that our T cells are lazy and aren't attacking these cancer cells the way they should. Now, if we outfit our T cells, fix the T cell receptor so that it can better recognize cancer cells, then the hope is that our lazy T cells will attack these cancer cells and drive them into apoptosis. The trick is how to outfit our T cells with um, receptors that attack cancer cells. And that can be done by winning the T cells uh, that we have circulating T cells um, and um, expressing in them a novel uh, engineered T cell receptor that recognizes cancer cells and then giving these T cells back, uh, 
first, we, there's a proliferation step here to make more T cells, and then giving these modified CAR T cells back to the patients so that their tumors are attacked. Now, in this particular paper that I'm going to show you, the antigen that was picked here is called B cell maturation antigen. And it, it's expressed also on plasma cells in patients with multiple myeloma. So B cell maturation antigen uh, was utilized as the antigen in this study because this antigen is expressed on myeloma cells specifically, and we'd like to kill those cells if we have multiple myeloma. So this is a safety study. So the primary endpoint here is safety. You can imagine that if we have these cells fighting each other in our bodies, it might cause some problems like the cytokine release syndrome that indeed happened. But these myeloma patients were pretty much at the end of their ropes because they had already flunked all these treatments that are outlined here uh, graphically here. So all the patients uh, got this. Uh, these patients got it in different dosages, and that was also accessed in terms of um, side effects and also in terms of possible responses. So everybody had side effects. This is not a trivial treatment. And uh, three quarters of the patients had cytokine release syndrome, which can cause major problems and can also kill you. So the adverse events are listed here, but we would expect those and we'll, we're willing to accept those in these patients that have no other options from their multiple myelomas. Then we can look at responses. And um, these are uh, not solely subjective. Uh, they're also objective because we can measure involvement and progression of disease and there's imaging modalities and. Uh, these oncologists hopefully knew what they were doing. But what we can see here is that there were responses in these patients, and the responses occurred to a greater degree in terms of the numbers of CAR T cells that the patients got. And we can look at that, a complete or stringent complete response is a light blue, a very good response is dark blue, and um, a few of the patients didn't respond at all, but basically most of the patients responded and uh, they responded in terms of the numbers of T cells that the patients got. So the ones that got a pretty good numbers, uh, got their CAR T cells in significant numbers, some of them were even still alive after 21 months, whereas the patients that didn't get very many uh, died more quickly. And we can look at subgroups that's shown here. So the response seems to be uh, based on the number of CAR T cells that you get and the side effects also. And we would expect that. So uh, then we can look at the number of T circulating T cells and transgene copies. And uh, that's also a function of how many T cells you got. And uh, so are the responses. So this looks like the CAR T cell strategy is also going to apply to patients with multiple myeloma. These CAR T cells, again, uh, are constructed so that they attack cells that express uh, BCMA, which is this B cell um, uh, antigen that's expressed by uh, multiple myeloma cells. Now, the review in the New England Journal concerns hypoparathyroidism. You'll recall that the parathyroid glands make parathyroid hormone, and parathyroid hormone results in resorption of bone by stimulating osteoclastic activity. It works in the kidney to cause phosphaturia and calcium reabsorption. It also has an effect inside the gastrointestinal tract, probably mediated by vitamin D, the synthesis of which occurs finally in the kidney and which is also driven by parathyroid hormone. Now, the release of parathyroid hormone is a function of the calcium sensing receptor. And the most frequent cause of hypoparathyroidism are our surgical friends, uh, and it concerns removal of the parathyroid gland during anterior neck surgery or perhaps injury to this organ. And that was the most common cause when I was in medical school. It's still number one, but autoimmune diseases and there are a number of those, or genetic causes are now more common because 
there have been substantial improvements in operating on the neck for thyroid disease. Now, um, the idea is to prevent hypoparathyroidism and good surgical training is a function of that. And so that's a reasonable uh, therapy and uh, um, et cetera, you could imagine that. I wanted to show this because hypoparathyroidism associated with basal ganglion calcifications. And this is a dramatic example here. Hypoparathyroidism is associated with low calcium values, tetany and all the symptoms that have to do with that. And we can look at, find that in the electrocardiogram because the QT interval is prolonged because the ST segment is longer. The T wave looks normal, but it's just further behind. Now there are genetic and other reasons to have hypoparathyroidism. Uh, DeGeorge syndrome is an example. Uh, there are metabolic diseases, there are autoimmune diseases, and there are also parathyroid resistance syndromes such as pseudohypoparathyroidism. I'm not going to go into these, but I'd just like you to know something about them. Now, the condition is treated with primarily with calcium and vitamin D. We also have to think about magnesium substitution because magnesium substitution is necessary that, to release endogenous parathyroid hormone. And we can also give parathyroid hormone. We used to have a beef extract of this, but nowadays a recombinant parathyroid hormone is better. And there's a short uh, uh, one, a 34 amino acid form of PTH that can also be given. So that's all discussed here and um, tests and imaging, and uh, you can look at that in detail. So urgent treatment of hypoparathyroidism involves the infusion of calcium, and for that, calcium gluconate is generally given, particularly if the material has to be given in a peripheral vein. So that's a review of the function of parathyroid hormone, and um, have a look at the review. Then this image in the, New England Journal, we're looking inside an ear, and we're looking at an eardrum of a nine-year-old boy who's hearing a buzzing noise, and we see that, and it's moving. So what is it? And that's what it was. Now, to get a nine-year-old to sit still to have a tick pulled out of his, off of his eardrum is a problem. So they gave this poor kid some propofol and got this tick out. Tick, eight legs, arachnid. Here's the patient from last week with acromegaly, and here's his scalp again. I was hoping they'd show his face and his hands, but they didn't. Um, he didn't. Uh, his head didn't get that much better when his acromegaly uh, was treated. The patient of the week in the New England Journal comes in because eh, he's got dysphagia, uh, s swallowing solids and liquids, he coughs a lot, and he got some weakness here. And they show a nice video of this, and you can look at that in the New England Journal. They gave him some blue stuff to drink, and it looks like he's aspirating some of it. It looks fairly uh, problematic. So he's examined, and he has, uh, he's got bitemporal wasting, suggesting that he has a, this is an important clue. Uh, well, you can palp palpate your own temporal muscles and you can bite down and you should have some there. And if you have bitemporal wasting, it in implies that the temporal muscles are diseased for some, uh, for, for some reason. And he has a hypophonic voice because he can't uh, cause these vocal cords to be opposed properly. So he can't say ka, ka, ka. And uh, do a... Uh, uh, Plain, uh, a plain x-ray would have been enough, but it looks like he has uh, bilateral aspiration pneumonia. So some experts look at him and he has subtle weaknesses of the muscles of the face uh, and his um, reflexes are, are diminished. So it, it looks like he either has a neurological or a muscle problem or perhaps both. And our patient last week had an amyotrophic lateral sclerosis where he had a upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron problem and fasciculations. But our patient here doesn't have fasciculations. And so there are a number of things that are considered here, uh, including uh, 
myotonic dystrophy. And uh, that's the, the discussion here. So he has esophago-gastroduodenoscopy. And so we, we can look at his vocal cords again here and after he swallows this blue stuff, then he has a whole bunch of fancy imaging tests. But what he's got is uh, myotonic dystrophy. And uh, these people, uh, this is a muscle disease. So they have muscle wasting and it's prominent in the face. They have temporalis wasting here. Uh, their eyelids may hang a little low, uh, but they also have gynecomastia. They have endocrine problems and they have type two diabetes and uh, uh, other uh, endocrine conditions. And their problem here is the dystroph dystrophia myotonica one protein kinase gene, uh, which includes CTG tandem repeats. And when the number of repeats is, if they have an expansion here, then this gene doesn't work properly. And then they have problems with um, um, their calcium pump and their muscle fibers degenerate. They didn't show the patient, but I found a patient uh, in the internet that was kind enough to put his photo in there and we can see this temporal wasting. And we can see how his eyelids hang too low. And uh, you can imagine that the facial muscles here are also weak. And the pro problem here, now this is RNA level, so instead of CTG, it's CUG. He's got an expansion here. And people that have uh, uh, more than 30 of these uh, have problems with uh, the genes involved here. And they have myotonic dystrophy. It's a classic disease, and you should know about it. Now, we'll move to the Lancet. And the first topic at the Lancet involves signaling of VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. And the vascular endothelial growth factor binds to a receptor which enables vessel development. And there is a soluble form of vascular uh, endothelial growth factor receptor, and it's called S-FLIT. Uh, uh, FLIT stands for uh, FEMS-related tyrosine kinase, and this is a tyrosine kinase receptor. And the FEMS gene was first discovered in cats, and you don't want to hear all about that, but that's why it's called FEMS. So soluble FLIT can capture VEGF so that VEGF signaling is impaired. Now, one place we need vascular development is when we're making a placenta. And here, the VEGF that's involved here is called placental growth factor, or PLGF. And soluble FLIT can catch placental growth factor, and then the placenta doesn't develop properly, and the women get preeclampsia, and the infants don't develop properly. And the person that drew attention to this is a personal friend of mine, and he, this is Anant Karumanshi. And so that's Anant, and that's a major contribution to medicine in general. Now, two years ago, there was a paper in the New England Journal, largely from Berlin. Stefan Falloren was senior author on this paper. And the investigators looked at the value of the relationship between soluble FLIT and placental growth factor in women during pregnancy to see if they could separate women that developed preeclampsia and eclampsia from women that had a normal pregnancy. And then they were able to do that. And then a validation cohort was defined. And the question is, um, OK, looks like uh, soluble FLIT and PLGF uh, are biomarkers for risk for preeclampsia. So the question in this important Lancet study was, can we use this, inflammation, this information to result in better outcomes in pregnant women? So this is called a step wedge cluster randomized control trial. And this is pretty involved and pretty clever. What was done here is the patients, all, lots of pregnant women here, and uh, PLGF was measured at intervals in all of them. And in half of them, according to this block rand uh, randomization scheme, the people taking care of these patients were told what the result was. And they were also given an algorithm that they were supposed to rely on in case the PLGF values were low. And then the investigators looked to see if the outcomes of the pregnancies uh, 
would be better if the clinicians had this information or if they didn't. And um, so what was this algorithm? And it has to do with the PLGF values and then decisions are made uh, in terms of treatment, whether the patient should be admitted to the hospital, whether they should be delivered early, whether their blood uh, pressure should be lowered. And I found the algorithm in the supplement, so, uh, but, but you can see it. And this is a standard British algorithm according to the NICE guidelines, how you're supposed to deal with patients with preeclampsia or at risk for preeclampsia. And uh, the, investi uh, the clinicians in this arm of the study relied on PLGF values to make decisions on how to treat the patients. Now, this study uh, was performed in the UK. Uh, and uh, there were white patients and black patients and Indian patients and Sri Lankan patients, et cetera. Uh, the incidence of preeclampsia, which in Europe in general is about 5%, but in some populations is up to 30%, was quite high in this study. Uh, so um, here are the hospitals in the UK that participated in this study. And uh, here are the women. and. Basically, baseline values in the two groups were the same, and uh, the decision to measure PLGF was a function of uh, dipstick proteinuria, did blood pressure go up, uh, are there any changes in laboratory values, platelet count, etc., uh, there, is there any evidence of uterine growth, retardation, etc., those were the clues whether or not PLGF was to be measured or not. And what we see here is that the uh, the patients that had their PLGF values revealed uh, did somewhat better than the patients whose PLGF values were concealed and not told to the clinicians. So in essence, this stepwise cluster randomized trial provided evidence that measuring PLGF and following an algorithm based on the measurements could lead to better pregnancy outcomes. The next study in the Lancet involves um, PD-1 ligand antibody and whether or not we can help patients with non-small cell lung cancer. We've looked at a number of these studies already, and uh, this trial is not too much different. It's a very large trial, uh, but it's basically similar to trials that we've looked at in the New England Journal. And if we look at this, we can uh, see the patients um, uh, Pembrolizumab compared to chemotherapy alone and um, randomization looks like it worked okay. And uh, the outcomes were also better in the patients that got pembrolizumab uh, compared to those that got chemotherapy alone. Uh, this is certainly no cure. So drug companies shouldn't brag too much about this, but it looks like the strategy worked in this study as it has in previous studies, and of course, there are problems with pembrolizumab and adverse events that were some, and you can inspect them here. So the added value of this trial is uh, giving pembrolizumab to patients with non-small cell lung cancer seems to result in an improved outcome. This next study is actually pretty interesting. I confess to being an alcohol user. Uh, this is a conventional and genetic evidence study on alcohol and vascular disease in China, and it involves a half a million people. And uh, so what's the big deal about China? Well, the big deal about China and Oriental countries in general is a genetic modification of alcohol dehydrogenase, and they have an isoform of alcohol dehydrogenase uh, that um, <clears throat> results in the Asian flushing syndrome. Uh, so that um, instead of metabolizing acetaldehyde further uh, to acetate, uh, they have high levels of acetaldehyde, which makes them sick. There's also um, a modification in the, in the alcohol dehydrogenase gene, which results in faster catabolism. Uh, but this variation in the alcohol uh, in the acid aldehyde dehydrogenase gene is more common in Orientals and less common in Europeans or in Black Africans. So what we find here is that this study confirms the idea that people that 
catabolize acid aldehyde poorly, uh, get sick, and therefore they have signals to drink less. And that was present. Uh, actually, there were so few women drinkers. The Chinese apparently don't let their poor women drink alcohol because uh, they didn't play a role in the study. But what we see here is it's amazing. Uh, here are people that are homozygous for this uh, variant. Uh, those are in red here that are homozygous for this variant that impairs acid aldehyde catabolism. Uh, they don't drink at all. And the people that are heterozygous drink some. And the people that are like we Europeans, uh, they're doing great. That's also true in Szechuan. Uh, and if we look at that, here's a, a current drinkers, ex-drinkers, um, uh, the women are in red, they don't touch the stuff, uh, but the men seem to enjoy this. And if they do, they have more problems with systolic blood pressure, they have more pro their HDL cholesterol values are better, uh, but their liver enzymes are worse and they get more strokes and intracerebral hemorrhage and so, et cetera. So the usual message is about alcoholism. Uh, 500 grams a week is quite a bit anyway. So that was that. The next study is um, vaccinating Africans. And we've all, had reviews on diphtheria and also reviews on tetanus recently. And both of these problems can be eliminated completely. But young people have to be vaccinated and they have to be vaccinated in the first year of life and they have to be vaccinated three times. And then they probably should get a fourth booster sometime during young adulthood. And African countries differ uh, in terms of DPT3 coverage, uh, and uh, Rwanda and Bur Burundi look pretty good, and Equatorial Guinea, et cetera, doesn't look so good. Now, the people that are responsible for this vaccination effort are the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and they've done a wonderful job in trying to secure a reasonable vaccination policy in Africa, and they're making progress, but there's still uncertainty and improvement can be warranted. And you can look at these maps, these heat maps in uh, detail yourselves, uh, but uh, we have excellent vaccinating capacities and there should be no young people anywhere on the planet that are confronted with this problem. Now, in The Lancet, there's a 25-page review on legal determinants of health. When I went to medical school, I don't think we even had a legal department. Oh, there were a couple of lawyers running around in case anybody got sued, but that wasn't very common either. We had a forensic medical department uh, trying to determine who was murdered or who was not, but otherwise, uh, knowing anything about the law, uh, didn't play much of a role. Now, all of that's changed. And um, uh, also, particularly in terms of policy and international policy and how healthcare is delivered, and that's discussed here. So there's binding international law, although I don't believe that the United States is too interested in that. And then there are soft rules and national governments and people and domestic law and uh, uh, what's in your constitution and that's variable from one country to another. And now medical schools have huge legal departments that I think are greater than the Department of Medicine, at least the one that I know. Uh, an example is hepatitis C. We have an excellent treatment for hepatitis C. And who's going to get the treatment and who doesn't? And what about the poor prisoners? Uh, they commonly have hepatitis C. And all of that's discussed here. Litigation as a tool to define the right to health. And we've learned that litigation can have positive effects. You look at the tobacco laws, for instance, if nothing else. Checks and balances. Uh, so these are social issues that are important. And um, so lawyers have moved into medicine. I don't feel great about all of this, but on the whole, I guess this has been a good idea. And you can look at these um, tables here. I've included here. You can look at all of this stuff. Uh, and uh, we can then decide whether or not we need more laws or less laws. Now, we'll close with this case in the Lancet, and it concerns a 73-year-old man who comes in with, um, he has hypertension and diverticulosis, and he comes in basically with signs of an acute abdomen. 
electrocardiogram is done and he's got some funny looking P waves, but it looks like it's synathorism, but we're not so sure. And he has a lot of atrial premature contractions. Long story short, a CT is done and he's had infarcts. Look at this big renal infarct here, this big splenic infarct. And um, so this is done with contrast agents. And on the next morning, we learn that he has atrial fibrillation. So uh, this is actually a pre-atrial fibrillation disaster. I think he's lucky that he didn't have a stroke. And with that, that's it for the English version. If you wanna hear all this in German, you can stick around and we'll do that shortly.